Some Christian people go back to the Bible to say, women, you must stay in your place. I read such an article yesterday in the news uh, from an academic in the Southern Baptist Church in the United States who only refers to one verse in the Bible that says women should be quiet. And it refers to it, it ignores all the other stories and references to the, in the New Testament that speaks about women and leadership in the church. Put yourself in first century Bible times and you will see how incredibly open the people of God were to women and the leadership of women. Go and read the, the whole of the story. Don't pick up what, one or two verses only. Go and read the story of Miriam, of Sarah, of Deborah, of Halda, of Esther, of Rispa, of Rahab, of Mary, of Mary Magdalene, of Tabitha, and Phoebe, and Junia, and Priscilla. Go and read the last chapter of the letter to the Romans and see how many women church leaders are listed there. Go and see the unnamed women that Jesus t t touches and teaches. The women that Jesus uses in his parable. Go and read the story about the woman in Proverbs chapter 31. She's an entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a woman of strength, a manager, a leader, a hard-working, wise role model. We must use the Bible when we use it to keep women in a box. Jesus himself opens up that box for us. When he has that tiny little conversation with Martha. Martha is working in the kitchen, preparing lunch, while Jesus is teaching in the lounge. And Jesus says to Martha, 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 you can cook another day. Come. And he invites Martha into the theological conversation in the lounge. A huge, huge thing for that time in the Methodist Church. Women, in the very beginning, were allowed to pray in church, to teach, to give testimonies. Even then, there were a handful of women that were allowed to preach. That's no wonder if you know the story of the early Methodists. The people through whom the Methodist Church came to be were two brothers, John and Charles. Their mother's name was Susanna. She didn't just have two boys. She had 19 children. And every single week, she paid special attention to each one of them. She was an amazing woman, an outstanding woman, who was the role model for John and Charles. Susanna was married to a priest as well, their father. And old Samuel was, was not a great fellow. <coughs> He used to go away off. He used to go off to London and she was left alone with 19 children, all those that survived um, at Edward, far away. And so she would just open the church and start preaching. And her husband would write to her and say, What? You're not allowed to do this. And she would write back to him and say, Well, then come back home and start preaching because I'm doing your work for you. By 1828, though, things had changed. And women were forbidden to become superintendent ministers. And they were, by the mid 50s, 1850s, written out of history because it wasn't seen to be the fashionable thing. If you wanted to be a, a church with status, you didn't have women do things in church. And so women were pushed to the side. For a long time, from 1850, 1976 in Southern Africa, the church made a big, big decision to say women can again be ordained in the church. And the first woman, our marvellous pioneer, was a woman named Reverend Constance Pustazen. And she was, a, she was a mega, mega uh, role model for women in the church. But it was difficult. In those days the church didn't quite know what to do with a woman preacher. They didn't know what to allow a woman preacher to wear. They didn't know what to do with a pregnant woman preacher. It was awkward, but let me tell you, Namibia was ahead of the rest of this connection. You were ahead. Do you remember women like Cornelia Dell? Yes. Pioneer women, par excellence. I'm still waiting for somebody to write a book about Cornelia. Anybody knows her well? We'll just start doing that. Please do. Lenita Conradi. 
Remember her? Yes. The only blind minister and academic who, by the way, has just obtained her PhD. And she's coming to Namibia next week or so to come and visit us. I will see whether I can get her to come to church on Sunday. I don't know if she'll be there on Sunday. Dolly Mosiani. You know her? My goodness. She's doing for us well. She's now in South Africa in Immaculate. And I tell you, she the other day was told that she couldn't get to a church to take a Holy Communion. She walked for miles to a church to get to serve the Holy Communion. You remember Willard from Louis Bowman, who was with us until recently, and stationed also in various parts of the country. The women have done you proud, the women. They have done you proud. I grew up in a home where it was encouraging and nurturing to me and my sister. We were always told you can do anything and you can be anything. I was never told I can't do something because I was a girl. But experiencing a call into ministry in my mid-twenties, all of those fears and insecurities and self-doubt almost derailed me. Almost made me to run away because I did not think I could do it. I did not think I had what it took. But how grateful I am. Now, more than 35 years later, that people encouraged me and I somehow trusted God to call me. Let me tell you, these have been three and more than three amazing decades of growing, of blessing, of challenge, of opportunities, and I'm so grateful to the journey the church has allowed me to take over these years, coming all the way to here and now. So, dear women, let me bring to you Psalm 27, which we read this morning earlier. And um, maybe you can even put the, the first song, some of that up on the screen and people can just browse their eyes over it. And I, out that amazing psalm, I just want to lift out four words for you. Just four words. Those four words have been the stay and the power in the lives of many, many Christian women who have taken up the role that God has called them to. And the first word that I call out, and as I read the, the, the passage and I read the context, the, the word that I would put into the passage is the word call. The psalm in verse 5 reminds us that the call of God is always firstly a call to come to God. It says, He will hide me in the shelter, in His shelter on the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. Can you just feel? It feels like the verse that says, He will hide me in the shadow of His wings. When God calls us, God calls us, Come closer. Come to me. That is what the call of God is about. The call of God says, Come closer. Come to me. Scripture reminds us that even before our birth, God knew, God called, God loved. You are here in church today because God called you to be here. There's no other reason, no other reason why you're in church today. Even if it came through your wife naming you, it's God's call that brought you here. You know the Lord, you trust the Lord, you love the Lord, because the Lord first called you to himself. But when God calls us, God also calls us to new things. God calls all of us to new things. To stepping out from your little corner and to live with all your potential, with all your love, with all your strength in ways that touch the world for good and then bring glory to God. This means different things for all of us. But young women, listen to me. Young women, listen to me. For each one of us, it means that there is a life that is bigger than yourself. A life that is not defined by what you cannot do. A life that is full of possibilities. You know a young woman, I know you know her well, called Mary. Young woman from Nazareth, who was confronted by an angel of God, who heard the call to become the mother of the Son of God, and she responded, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. One of my favorite writers is Barbara Brown Taylor, and she puts it this way. She says, on the one hand, 
She was just a girl. She's talking about Mary. She was just a girl, an immature, frightened girl who had the good sense to believe what the angel told her. And she ended up changing the future of the world. When we allow God to be born in us, there's no telling, no telling at all of what will come out. I don't know. I don't know. I know a young woman named Cindy, amazing young woman. She has cerebral palsy. She cannot walk. She cannot talk. She cannot feed herself. She sits in a wheelchair. But you know what? She paints the most beautiful pictures with her mouth. Fine little paint, fine, fine little paintbrush. And she paints greeting cards with her mouth. I would say Cindy lives with all her potential, with all her love, with all her strength, in ways that touch the world for good to the glory of God. You can too. Don't say you can't be called of God. Don't say you have no potential. Don't say you have no strength in ways that touch the world for good. Don't say you can't be called by God. When you know you are called, let them say what they will. When you know you are, that you are called, let me tell you from experience, your calling supersedes your fears. Your calling supersedes other people's prejudices. It's knowing that you are called by God that places your feet on a firm rock and nothing can shake you. No doubt, no fear, no prejudice. Young woman, listen to this. Listen for God's call. Because living in God's call will make you more than you ever thought you could be. Likes it. Women, listen for God's call. Now let me tell you, in this church, we have only excellent local preachers. Local preachers, why don't you just stand for a moment? I'm going to don't do anything to you. I just want people to see you. <laughs> what do you notice, women? Women, what do you notice? Men. They're wonderful, we love you. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> but don't tell me that there's no woman in this church called to be a preacher. And the, men, the male preachers agree with me, I'm not saying anything that they disagree with. Our, our male preachers are wonderful, but we need women in the team. Women, I know that there are some of you who are exceptionally used to this speaking and speaking the word of God. Think about it. Think about it, and if, if you want to explore it, go and speak to one of our preachers, or come and speak to me. And we can tell you the steps you may take to explore the possibility of becoming a preacher. So the second word I want to bring to you is confidence. The psalmist speaks of confidence in Psalm 27, he says, Now my heart, my head is lifted up above my enemies around me. Can you just see the confidence? My head is lifted up above my ears. One of the stories I love is that story about a young girl. Maybe she was about 10 years old. Slave in a foreign country. Only to speak when spoken to. Only to obey the master and then retreat. Never to speak. Never to have an opinion. She sees the master of the household get sick and nobody can help them. And in confidence, just that little 10 year old in a foreign country, in a household where she's a slave, speaks up. Not to question, not to request help, no, to offer advice. She gives him a chance at healing as she sends her master to the prophet of Israel, to Elisha, and name of Israel. What confidence! She could have been shushed. She could have been banished or even killed for just being disrespectful, a disrespectful girl, child, slave. But she knew what she knew, and she knew who she trusted, and her faith overtook her fear. And in confidence, she could have said, No, my head is lifted up above my enemies around me. And she offers healing to the enemy. Here's a third word courage. The psalmist says, whom shall I fear? And the answer is in mine. No one. Whom shall I fear? Queen Esther was one of the great stories of courage of women in the Bible. Okay? 
facing the threat of death as she went to the king to plead for the Jews of their country in exile, and she was rewarded for her courage. Do not doubt this. There are some amazingly courageous women. I heard a story this week, told by a friend of a woman called Rosie. She went rowing in the Matokwas National Park. A 65-year-old woman in a blow-up boat with a 90-year-old man in the boat with her. Can you picture it? Because it happened in 2018. They were told there were no crocodiles there. Mm -hmm. Who knows the Matokos? A crocodile came and attacked them. Punched the boat. Grabbed her by the arm. She tried to push her arm deeper into his throat to try and choke him. With the other arm, she started bashing the crocodile, but nothing happened. Eventually, somebody on the on this edge got a gun and started shooting at the crocodile, and the crocodile released suddenly. And with her mangled arms, she rode to the shore. Unfortunately, this was too much for the 90-year-old. And he had a heart attack on the boat, but she survived. She got herself to the shore with two mangled arms and she's alive today. Is that courage? One of the gifts we are given as children of God is courage. When you know who you are, when you know who you belong to, you can lift up your head and not stand back for anyone. For women, knocking on doors of all kinds of spaces in the world that have been reserved to men, we need courage. And by now, there are women who have entered into many places where they are only male orientated. Even racing car driving, there are some women racing car drivers. What would you do? Ladies, what would you do if you had unfailing courage? How would it change you if you had courage? How would it change the way you face the world, the things you try? How would it change the way you represent Jesus in your life? The world will be a different place, dear young woman. We all have courage. We have the courage of Rosie, who wouldn't stop until she was saved. There's a fourth word perseverance. When you look at the Bible, it is full of womanly strength. And the women of perseverance that first come to my mind, and there are more, are Hannah. Remember how she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed with us. She said, Until the priest said to a lady, What's wrong with you? She said, I want a baby and I will not stop praying. Remember? She had a baby. His name was Samuel. Samuel. Remember the story that Jesus tells about a persistent woman who wouldn't stop nagging and nagging and nagging the judge until she was heard. She was a, had a boldness that was surprising. She had the strength and the courage. She wouldn't be stopped by anything. And let me tell you, it was not by accident that Jesus used a woman as the character in that story because perseverance is a very womanly characteristic. There are many stories about perseverance. Stories that we can tell today. But let me tell you, the most important stories of perseverance of women are those anonymous women who live everyday lives that nobody even knows about, who persevere, who will do job after job, who will go without so that they can make sure their children can eat, and their children can get to school, and their children can get to secondary school, and their children can get to college. Those mothers are women of perseverance. And there are many mothers, my own, my own included, who sacrifice greatly and persevere so that their children could get somewhere where maybe they were afraid. These are important stories of perseverance. Go and listen to the stories of the women in your family and how they persevere. The little people who take seriously that they are not alone and that they can make a difference, and they do. And so the psalm ends with verse 14. It says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Here's another translation of that same version, of that same verse, verse 14. It says, Stay with God. Take heart. Don't quit. I'll say it again. Stay with God. That is confidence. That is courage. That is perseverance. 
These are gifts for all of us. But today, I encourage you especially for your little mothers. Take hold of these four words. Call, courage, confidence, perseverance. Amen. We sing a hymn that speaks of the perseverance of the people who travel through the desert to the promised land. And as we come to the word that say, bread from heaven, bread from heaven, feed me now and ever more. We remember the manna. The confirmation class knows a lot about the manna, eh? Hey? We remember the manna in the desert, but we also remember that this is the manna for us. The bread of heaven that comes to feed us. God, we owe love for a journey.